this impact of AI has really just kind of shaken us all up. And I think AI is so new that even in communications, we're like, what does this mean? And then specifically in the workforce too, what does this mean as well? So I've invited Lucas Levine from Future Fit AI and then Kevin Cranick from Win to talk about um, what AI means really in this workforce services, but then also in the work that we're doing. And I've seen both of them obviously present in two different platforms. And Kevin and I were kind of bouncing around ideas. And I thought, what a dynamic presentation it would be to bring both of them together. So um, I'm not going to read their bios because I sent them to you guys a bunch of times. And we're already running out of time because I know both of these presenters could talk at length about. AI. So I'm going to just kick it right off to Lucas and stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Alicia. And you're right, I, I can talk at length. Um, and so make sure to, to hold me accountable. I'll be watching the, the clock as best I can. Do want to do a quick check in on in terms of the amount of time that I should be shooting for? Is it about 15 minutes with a little bit of time for Q&A? And then uh, um, before passing it over to Kevin? Correct. Yeah, we said like 15 yeah. to 20 minutes and then um, we'll do a 30 minute total presentation with like the 15 minutes of Q&A. OK, that sounds perfect. Uh, you mentioned that AI is something that's kind of new and fast changing and there are all these developments and there's reality. I've given a version of this presentation before, but even if I gave this presentation a month ago, so much happens in a month that there are new things that I have to bring each and every time. And so excited to share my and, and future for AI's latest view on the impact of, of AI on work and workforce services. So I'm just going to share my my screen quickly. And as I do that, it would be helpful if folks could just pop into the chat. Would love to level set on level of familiarity with some of these things. And so if you wouldn't mind sharing, have, have folks heard, for example, of chat GPT, uh, which is an, an, a generative AI tool that has become very popular in the last year or so. Would love to see if anyone hasn't maybe drop that in the chat. I just um, helps me know what level of depth um, I should go in in certain topics. So at least one person has used the novice, heard of it. Amazing. All right. So we got a group mostly. I'm sure there are a few people in here who either haven't heard of ChatGPT or certainly haven't used it before. It'll be relevant to what we talk about today, but I'll make sure to give at least a little bit of a primer. So. Just want to confirm, are you able to see my screen with the cover page, the title slide? We are. All right, wonderful. Then let's get started. So we'd love to start by just illustrating some of the things that are possible with generative AI today. So these are all things that I have produced, a professional resume personalized for me based on my experience with super punchy and compelling language about each of my experiences, just from a little bit of detail about job titles that I've held in the past. The second, an analysis of 10,000 job seekers work history using data that was automatically pulled out of their resume. And so uploaded 10,000 resumes to a system, classified all of the jobs and work experiences that these people have had previously and put it into a nice neat little table for me, just like that. And then lastly, this is a digital rendering of me giving you this Zoom presentation right now. This is a, an image that was auto-generated using a generative AI tool uh, of a young, blonde-haired man in business casual uh, delivering a Zoom presentation. And I think the most spectacular thing about these tools and, and these uh, these products is that all of these things, all three were produced in the hour before this call. And so obviously the quality and the speed of output using AI can be spectacular. Would love to quickly get a gauge from the group. You know, there's so much talk and so much uh, tension in some ways around topics of AI. So many questions, so much uncertainty. Would love if you could just pop in the chat, maybe one or two feelings that you would bring to this presentation today and, and how you think about AI. Excited but apprehensive, excited. I think excited but apprehensive is a perfect summation of the average feeling that, that folks tend to have around this topic. I think both of those things are, 
are, yeah, are very, very true and, and valid. Scary, it will replace my job. Absolutely. And so we're going to get into um, all of these things over the course of the presentation, and I will be as quick as I can. It's a presentation that usually can be 45 minutes to an hour, but we'll make sure to just hit the, um, the most important points. Before we really get started, would love to do a brief introduction. Um, so I'm Lucas Levine. I lead customer success for Future Fit AI. And I start here because a lot of people are probably most have never heard of us before. And I'm aware that there's a lot of information and including disinformation going around about what AI is. And so just want to make sure you understand who your source is today. And Future Fit AI is a workforce uh, development technology company uh, that's been using AI for years since long before ChatGPT to help job seekers navigate career pathways and to help workforce agencies uh, improve service delivery. And so we, we mostly work uh, with state and local agencies uh, within workforce and economic development, you'll see, and maybe you've, you've heard in, in other settings, but we currently have a project with Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Um, we've uh, built the Michigan Career Portal, um, which is a part of the You Can in Michigan campaign, um, but also do work in about a dozen states across the country. So that's who's speaking to you, relatively credible source, I hope. What we'll cover today, an overview of AI very briefly, why generative AI, things like ChatGPT are different from earlier forms of AI, how generative AI is changing how we work, what that means for workforce development specifically, and if you're interested and you haven't gotten started already, how you can get started in using some of these tools in your own work. November 20, 2022. Does anyone know or does anyone remember what happened on this day? I'm going to look to the chat for someone to, to give me the answer. I'm sure someone does. Well, since we're time constrained, I'll reveal it. This is the day uh, that ChatGPT was publicly launched. Um, and it really, uh, ChatGPT, for those who don't know, is essentially the first user interface for generative AI. It is a chat bot that you can have a... Uh, a robust and complicated conversation with, get advice, write documents, all these sorts of tools. And it really on this day shot like a meteor from outer space uh, onto the public consciousness. And it might not have felt like it at the time, but I would argue from what we've seen in the last 18 months or so, if you look 5, 10, 20 years down the line, this is going to be a day that was really a turning, turning point in history. I want to quickly show you how popular how and how fast uh, ChatGPT shot onto the scene. If you look at some of these other popular technologies, the amount of time it took them to reach a million users, Netflix, three years, Facebook, 10 months, the iPhone, two months, and ChatGPT, five days. And about six months after uh, launching, already had 1.8 billion monthly users. And so just incredible in terms of the speed of the reach. 1.8 billion monthly users. There are 8 billion people on the planet. A quarter of them were using uh, ChatGPT on a monthly basis. So really incredible how this has been able to reach people from all over the world. And so really the world has, uh, since this moment, woken up to AI, which, which is a category of technology that is undoubtedly going to reshape our world. And for the purposes of today's conversation, it's going to reshape the world of work right the types of jobs and careers that are available the nature of the work that we do in those jobs and how we can help people navigate a fast-changing labor market and so we'll talk about that impact today um, and also talk about how workforce uh, agencies folks in workforce development can take advantage of these tools to to fight back right to arm people uh, with the information and the tools they need to to navigate uh, the world of work and so Quickly, I'll give you a very quick briefing on, on AI and then specifically with generative AI. AI, very simply put, is combining uh, computer science and data to automate tasks at, at its very basic. And this is something that has been around since at least the 60s. There have been applications of artificial intelligence. What's changed has been the emergence of generative AI. And so to, just, to kind of explain the difference, we, we have these two categories which you can see here on the screen. There's predictive AI and generative AI. Predictive AI is what we've had historically, and this is about classification. So if I were to show you a million pictures of cats and a million pictures of dogs, 
you start to get an understanding of what a, what a dog looks like, what a cat looks like. And so if I were to show you a new picture of a dog or a cat that you've never seen before, you or to, to be more accurate, the computer, right, this AI would be able to predict whether that picture is a cat or a dog. With generative AI, I can show you a million pictures of cats, start to get an understanding of what a cat looks like, what are the underlying characteristics of a cat, the distinguishing features, and then the computer, the AI, would produce a new picture of a cat that's never existed before using, using the same properties that it learned from the previous million. And so that's really the distinction between what we used to use as predictive AI is classification, which, for example, is something that our company does in helping people understand career pathways based on you know, a million job seekers with a similar profile to you. Here are the types of careers that might be a good fit for you specifically. Generative AI is something new. And it's changed a lot. Even since November when ChatGPT launched, it's just gotten better very, very fast. And so some of the amazing innovations we've seen have been the ability not just to produce text, but to produce images, to produce video, to produce audio with just a simple prompting of text. Some people might have seen, I think there was a controversy around Drake had a song, the, the, the artist, the musical artist Drake had a song that was produced that sounded just like him with his rhythm. And it was actually just produced using artificial intelligence. And there are obviously clearly challenges and, and risks and something like that, but also incredible capability. They're becoming more intelligent, more human-like in the interactions, incredible amount of ability to absorb large amounts of data. And then I think for today's conversation and ultimately where the biggest impact is, is this last note around automated agents that can perform tasks. And so it's not just about responding to queries, but independently being able to perform actions in an automated way that really change the, the efficiency with which we can do our work. And so we'd love to get, uh, I know it's, we've had limited engagement, it's hard, uh, and a lot of people might not be in front of the computer necessarily, but would love to hear from one or two people, what is one part of your job that you would prefer to never do again? And you can either drop it in the chat or come off, uh, come off mute, whichever you prefer. As we're waiting we for yeah. people to drop stuff in the chat, one thing that I just I'm very anal about is I like things in alphabetical order. And so mm -hmm. when I'm working with a lot of different partners or um, documents or whatever it may be, like bullet points, doing that in alphabetical order was just a nightmare, you know, moving them around yeah. and chat GPT has helped me. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a fantastic one and there's uh, yeah i think just the editing and the organization of of yeah. content in, in addition to generating new content is amazing and writing dol reports seem to have has gotten uh, i couldn't agree more on that one seems to have gotten a lot of love and well uh, gl glad glad to inform you that ai can be an amazing tool in helping you write your dol reports and the reality is it's impacting every industry it's impacting every function Right. I mean, if you look at, uh, I think there's some really interesting, there's even been a case around it, but around legal contracts, patent applications, the ability to fully automate some of the writing and, and even the application of some of these things. With engineering, you now have uh, engineers who have been able to 10x the speed with which they can uh, produce lines of code um, using tools uh, built with generative AI. And then for this group specifically, I did a little bit of research. I'm not an expert in marketing and communications myself, but did look at some of the types of use cases that we're seeing application of generative AI. And so, of course, generation, creating content, extraction, you know, being able to read articles and summarize articles, summarization, rewriting. You know, you might write an initial email, but if you want to change the tone or, for example, adapt it to a different reading level. Uh, they have the ability to rewrite your content for you and then classification, being able to understand who a user is and, and target information to them accordingly. So some pretty spectacular applications within marketing, too. Uh, but shifting over to workforce development, which is a space that I work in and I know a lot of you all do as well and really want to spend the rest of our time just focus on these key lessons for workforce development. 
And the first one is that we do need to respect the risks. And I'll spend a little bit time, more time talking about that because I think it's probably the most important thing here. The risks are real and the risks do need to be contained. My view and our view is that we can't let that stop us from taking advantage of the really incredible opportunities that are here. The second is that it started with chatbots. I've talked about ChatGPT a lot, but really where the impact is, is full automation of workflows, which is really a really exciting thing. And I'll share more about what that can look like in workforce development. And then the third, it might seem like clickbait, kind of a hot take, but I, but I very deeply believe this, and I'll spend a little bit more time, is that AI can actually make the work of workforce development more human. And I think I would prompt you, and we'll come back to it, but I would prompt the group to think, how, how humane is today's workforce development system? And I think there are a lot of ways in which it is. There are a lot of incredible people doing the hard, very human work in supporting job seekers, but there's also a lot that's really administrative and that's really hard for job seekers. And so ultimately I think AI can be a support uh, for that. And so starting with the risks, um, as I said, I think this is incredibly real. Uh, there were a few folks who um, who talked about being, you know, feeling, feeling a sense of fear around the emergence of AI and what that means for potentially job loss. And I think that there are real uh, risk that we need to be uh, cognizant of. And I'll talk about some of what those look like with AI specifically. But I also do want to name that anytime a new technology arrives, it generates fears about how those technologies might be used for evil or for the unintended consequences they, that they might have. I think this was very true if we think about recently with social media, where only 10, 15 years later, we've started to understand the repercussions specifically uh, for young people. Uh, but there was also an example, you know, in kind of combing through the history books that people had similar fears about the printing press and the, the invention of books and, you know, this fear that there would be this horrible spread of disinformation. People who, you know, weren't as wise, weren't as knowledgeable would be producing and disseminating books and, and causing, you know, to total chaos over the course of the society. And that was probably true to some extent. There's, there's definitely disinformation out there in books and on net, I think we're in a better world because books exist. And so I don't I don't mean to trivialize the risks here because they are really real, but just noting that we we find a way, right? When we respect those risks and we address them directly, we can take advantage of the opportunities. <clears throat> but the risks here, I do I think about equity, right? How do we make sure that when we introduce AI, we're not mirroring existing biases, but actually rooting them out? We think about security and privacy. How do we make sure that we are protecting user security. We think about impact on workforce and jobs. Someone already named that in the chat. It's something I think about in my work every single day. That's why tools like Future Fit AI exist to help people adapt to changing economy and continue to upskill and find opportunities for a good career. But but there will be an impact and how we manage that is really important. I think when you look at the opportunities, some headlines that paint a rosier picture. And again, these, none of these things are guaranteed, but I think we can work together to, to make sure that, that there's more positive than there is negative uh, with the emergence of AI. And so that's the first lesson to learn, respect the risks, embrace the opportunities. The second, as I mentioned, uh, it's not just about chatbots, it's really about full workflows. And so I have a couple examples here. This is a pretty amazing one, an early tool, uh, about a little over a year old, but this is a tool that allows you to create a website just from taking a picture from, from from drawing something in a notepad and taking a picture of it. And so this is a tiny little drawing on a one page notebook. Take a picture, upload that to the website and or upload that to the AI tool and it will code the entire website for you. Set up the domain name and launch that website to the open Internet. Second example, which is even more fun automatically suing robo callers, which I think is, is fantastic. And so this is an app on your phone. You get a call from a robo caller, you open your AI app, you hit one button and it traces the phone number back to whoever the, the marketing agency would be. And it automatically files a lawsuit against that individual, against that company for having sent you that, uh, that, um, that message. So, Incredible if you think about the complexity of just one click, an entire set of workflow. And what that looks like in workforce development, you can imagine for career coaches, you have an individual who walks into a job center or connects with, you know, over the phone or online with a with a rare background or it's a very specific background. So this might be a disabled veteran in IT. The career coach using a generative AI tools could look at all of the previous 
cases, the entire case record and finds uh, finds what potential pathways would be, right? Finds how where in the history of our, our service have we delivered service to other disabled veterans in IT? And then from that, develop an individualized employment plan with targeted recommendations that are going to be best for this individual and creates their case management notes. And so that could all be done in a fully automated fashion with, of course, the career coach still being that incredibly important, especially with more uh, barrier to challenge um, communities, still being there on the front lines to support that individual with the human touch that is always going to be required. For recruiters, imagine you're launching a new business unit, hiring 100 people could automatically identify the exact set of skills that are needed for each of those jobs, what companies have employees with those skill sets, send out a personalized note, literally personalized to a thousand people who seem like they might be good candidates uh, and invite them to the hiring process. And so just amazing, again, amount of efficiency that can be achieved with some of these tools. The last lesson that I'll leave you with, and we'll bring it to a close, is this controversial idea that AI can make this work more human. And, and what do I mean by that? Because I don't say that lightly. It's not supposed to be you know, silly or I, this is just, I think, really, really important and real point for me. I talked up front about so much of the work that happens in workforce services is, is incredibly administratively heavy, both for the staff member and for the job seeker, right? We talked about writing DOL reports. That's one example, but there's so much admin, right? Eligibility and enrollment, preparing reports, copy editing resumes and cover letters. Imagine if we could fully automate or mostly automate some of those tasks. We would have so much more time to actually help people, right? Freeing up staff time to support job seekers with the greatest barriers who really do need deep human intensive support to provide actual coaching not just taking someone and funneling them into the same training programs that we've funneled people into for years, regardless of whether it's a good fit for that individual, but actually deeply engaging with and understanding the person's motivations, the person's hopes, the person's challenges, and finding them the right path. And then lastly, building community partnerships. So actually getting out into the field, doing that community-based work so we can get deeper in and, and reach individuals who've often been left out of the workforce system, so much more time and capacity to do that if we weren't spending so much time writing DOL reports. And, and lastly, what these tools actually bring is actually specific capabilities of reaching and supporting underserved groups. And so with generative AI, there's the ability to have live translation to any language or vernacular. How many people walk into a job center or call in to a job center and you don't have someone on staff who speaks their native language, that's no longer an obstacle to still helping that person get support with tools from generative AI. Same thing with optimization for reading levels, uh, levels of digital literacy, um, pe people with visual speech and hearing impairments. You have these, this incredible ability to speak to uh, or write to generative AI and get the response in visual, get the response in auditory, whatever um, ultimately that individual needs. And so we talk about making this work more human. I, I really do mean it. It's not inevitable. I think the emphasis on the word can, um, because there are a lot of ways in which we can introduce this as wouldn't achieve that goal, but but it, the possibility is there. And so just to close out those three less, the risks, embrace the opportunities. It's not just about chatbots, it's about full workflows and AI really can make our work more human. And so if you wanna get started on this, ChatGPT is up there. It's free. If you haven't used it, highly recommend at least experimenting. I think there's an ability to work with companies like a future of AI, um, but there are uh, some others out there as well who are building AI tools specifically for workforce and for mm -hmm. education. And lastly, there are a lot of people on this call who do seem to have some experience with ChatGPT. If you don't, give them a call, check in with people, see how they are leveraging in this, in this in their work. I think there's a lot to learn. And so it's been 500, 453 days since that November 20 day back in 2022. That's not a long time in the scheme of things. If I were to think about where we'll be 453 days from now, this presentation would look completely different. The pace of change is incredible. I think the opportunities are incredible and invite you all to engage with this, ask the hard questions, certainly respect the risks, but there's so much opportunity to take advantage of. So I appreciate the time today. The only thing I'll leave you with uh, as a closing uh, plug is that Future Fit AI has actually recently launched 
uh, our first generative AI product. So this is a generative AI conversational career assistant available 24 seven and 50 plus different languages um, and adaptive to, to the local context um, of that individual. So really excited about that as a new tool that we're piloting um, with workforce boards across the country. Um, but in any case, appreciate the time. I know I've gone a little bit over and so apologize, but hopefully this was informative. Outstanding. Thank you, Lucas. Um, as we pull up Kevin or as Kevin pops in um, and gets his presentation ready, I just want to let you all know you can leave your questions in the chat for Lucas. He will be around. Um, we only have about 30 more minutes, but um, thank you, Lucas. And I'm going to hand it off to Kevin. Yeah, terrific. I really appreciate the work here again, Lucas. Um, for those who don't know, I was in attendance for some, uh, I believe it was the state of Michigan held a webinar series last year, which is where we first were introduced uh, between Wynn and Lucas over with Future Fit AI. And when Alicia and I were uh, discussing some ideas for today's presentation, we thought, why don't we get a hold of Lucas and see if we can get him to share some of that. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to try and leave room for questions for Lucas uh, at the end as well. So let me go ahead and jump on my screen here. I'm also really excited because I think what a lot of participants today are going to find is um, some really common threads between the findings that the data committee put together, or excuse me, the data team here at WIN put together for the committee today. Um, there's there's several common threads between our presentation and Lucas's presentation. So again, uh, whatever questions you have at the end, either Lucas or myself will be happy to answer those. But let's go ahead and dive in. I'm Kevin Cranick. I think I've participated in one or two other comms committee meetings previously, but for those who are hearing me for the first time, my background is uh, prior to WIN, which I've been with the team for about a year and a half now. Um, prior to this experience, I worked for a survey analytics firm in northern Michigan where I uh, completed my time there as the director of marketing. So I do have a bit of marketing background. I'm going to try and leverage some of that experience today as we walk through the presentation. Uh, but I also have some experience in opinion research and survey analytics, and I completed my MBA with the University of Michigan in 2017. So today we're going to focus on developments in AI. So again, we're going to see some very common themes here, but specifically the content that I've prepared for you today has a heavy focus on the AI report, uh, the study that was released by Goldman Sachs in 2023. I believe it was in March or April of last year where they came out with some some really intriguing findings highlighting how AI uh, is projected to impact the workplace. And of course, now that we're already in 2024, even in just these um, you know, 10 or 11 short months since that paper was released, we're already starting to see some of that impact. So uh, today we wanna talk about how generative AI is changing the market, looking at workplace productivity, how some of the careers and uh, occupational industries are going to have a disproportionate uh, impact from AI. So we'll look at occupational exposure and then we're also going to take a look at some gender perspectives on AI implementation in the workplace because uh, independent research has also found that there may be some disparity uh, from a DEI perspective. And then finally, we'll wrap things up taking a look at some free tools. And uh, I tried to put my marketing hat on to give some ideas for how to encourage people that are new to AI tools to start taking uh, some opportunities to learn more about them. So I know Lucas already talked about what generative AI is, so I'll just quickly gloss over this one here. Some of the tools that many of you have probably heard by now, ChatGPT, of course, they were the pioneer in this space uh, for generative AI. Google now has Gemini, which used to be Bard, so they have not only enhanced that tool, but they've already changed the name just one year in. Uh, and then another one that we've been looking at closely within Win in the last couple of months is Microsoft Copilot, uh, which is tremendously valuable. I can't speak highly enough of the integrations that Microsoft has built into Office 365 and what that's capable of doing. Um, but uh, 
Again, really quick uh, AI characteristics. They're generating novel human-like output, uh, and then you can interact with many different tools, not only with uh, natural language processing, but also by feeding it images. I know Lucas mentioned um, you know, providing cat images and having it create one of its own. It's using inputs from the users to generate novel ideas and outputs. So one thing I thought would be kind of fun, and Alicia, if you wouldn't mind, um confirming that i'm still showing my browser now and that we're away from the presentation you are yeah awesome so this is a fun ai tool that i thought uh, well it's not so much a tool but i wanted to use it quickly today just to demonstrate um, how far along AI and generative AI in particular has come uh, with respect to image generation. So this is a fun site you can visit, whichfacesreal.com, and one of the images is a real photo and the other one is AI generated. So um, just a quick activity with everybody, if you wouldn't mind sharing, do you think photo A is the real one or photo B is the real one? So I'll give you a moment to check that, and then I'm going to uh, lean on Alicia again. Do we have um, any responses, anybody that wants to dare a guess at this, or if I should just pick one randomly? <laughs> We're mixed. People are saying A and B, and okay, there's another well, one for B. Okay, let's go ahead and check with B, but I think even just seeing B is incorrect. So B is a fully AI-generated image. Now, to be completely candid, um, I've played this a few times when I've done similar presentations for AI, and I swear every time I revisit this site, it seems like they've enhanced the tool and it's gotten a little bit better. But we can see, you know, just from something so simple, a, a free website that's generating AI images and comparing them against real photos, just how powerful these tools are in terms of what they can produce on the fly. So I uh, thought that would be a, a fun little interactive start to the presentation. Uh, really interesting how far these tools have come in just a, a relatively short time uh, in terms of generative AI. So getting into the Goldman Sachs study specifically, we wanted to explore what the productivity is suggesting. And you can see from the benchmark global item here, uh, as indicated in the gray bar, uh, some of the research is suggesting productivity increases in the one to one and a half percent range uh, on a global scale. So obviously we have some emerging markets compared against uh, developed markets. Uh, no surprise here, any of the developed markets that have robust economies and have resources and companies that are devoting a lot of time, energy, and money towards AI development, they're going to be a little bit ahead of the curve. We can see that Hong Kong is well above the rest of the peer group, looking closer at the 2% uh, productivity growth over a 10-year horizon compared with India, who's just above uh, half of percent here. But even still, when we look at the aggregate, we're talking about, uh, again, anywhere from a one to one and a half percent increase on average um, globally. So the impact that AI is projected to have over the next 10 years is enormous. It, it cannot be understated. And then looking at additional research cited in this graphic here, this one focused more on the annual worker productivity growth. So now we're going from the macro view, focusing a little bit more on the microeconomics of the impact that AI is going to have. Uh, within these five research papers that were analyzed, we're looking at an average of 3.1% in worker productivity increase. So it really is outstanding to see the different perspectives. We're talking about job offsets, talking about worker productivity. Um, and I thought this quote was really interesting, so I thought I should add it here, that most workers are employed in occupations that are exposed to AI automation, uh, but following AI automation, at least some of that freed up capacity will increase their productivity. So what we're looking at is uh, potentially offsetting some tasks, but also eliminating others altogether. So when we got a little further into that report, we found this graphic that 
really tells a more complete story about what we should expect in terms of AI automation over the next few decades based on historical averages from other um, technological improvements. So looking specifically at the industry level breakdown when we have uh, professionals, a lot of the current professional positions are jobs that did not exist in 1940. Um, we see a very small share uh, as indicated by the green coloring here that uh, a very small share of the professional occupation patients uh, even existed uh, 60 years ago. So as we uh, look across the rest of the categories, we can see that there are some that intuitively are going to be less impacted. So farming is a great example. Uh, the difference between the two are indiscernible. It, it's very easy to see that an equal number or close to equal number of occupations existed in 1940, as well as new ones. So really interesting to see that breakdown at the industry level. And then when we compare that against this graphic on the right side, the re-employment of workers in new roles after technology had displaced them, and then the total displacement of workers from old roles. So this graphic I love because it gives us a really nice view of when things started to change um, and started to have a bit more deviation. So if you follow from 1950 up until about 1980, we can see that the rate of reemployment and the rate of displacement were relatively steady, right around half a percent of workers uh, were reemployed compared with the half percent that had been displaced from those jobs due to technological improvements. And then right around the green shaded area here was the IT automation boom. I'm sure just about everybody who's present today uh, was uh, at least alive during this era where we saw all of those dot coms begin popping up. We had, you know, Internet 1.0 that was uh, really the dawn of change with e-commerce and everything else that came from that. And that's really where we start to see this deviation increase a bit more. So the red line indicating average displacement uh, over the years, it really started to increase and separate from that steady rate of reemployment. So even though the rate of reemployment has held steady, the total displacement of workers from old roles has increased during the automation boom of the late 90s and early 2000s. And I think what the, the graphic is intending to suggest is that because AI is so similar in nature to the scope of technological improvement that the dot-com era brought about, it wouldn't be surprising if we extrapolated uh, these values over the next 10 to 20 years, that AI is going to have a similar impact. Um, so one of the interesting findings uh, from this first chart here was that 60% of workers today are employed in occupations that did not exist in 1940 which to me implies that with all of this AI revolution, we're going to expect even more roles uh, that will come about as a result of AI implementation and new AI tools that are just going to completely shift the way that jobs are done in the next few decades. So we're really interested to see how that plays out. I'm personally interested to see whether that growth is going to be more linear or whether it's going to be a bit more exponential in nature. So I think the next five years, we're going to learn a lot about what to expect in terms of growth and the projections of AI's impact. So getting a bit more microeconomic focused here, which occupations are most exposed to generative AI? Looking at all industries, and this particular chart focuses on the task automation facet of AI. So not necessarily looking at which jobs are going to be replaced, but within each occupation group, how many uh, or what percentage of the tasks within that group are expected to be automated. So looking across all industries, we're estimating, or rather the paper is estimating that 25% of work tasks will be automated by AS in the US and Europe. So again, looking at the developed markets that have the resources and the companies that are uh, investing heavily in AI research, uh, they're expecting a 25% increase across the board. Now, what's even more fascinating about that figure is this is an all industry overview but when we look at some such as building and grounds cleaning and maintenance there's very little in the way that 
AI can impact that industry because it is so hands-on. It, it, it's so physically intensive that um, AI is unable to have much of an impact. So only a 1% estimated change in worker task automation compared to office and administrative support. And I believe this also supports the findings that Lucas shared with us up to 46 percent nearly half of the tasks that exist currently within office and administrative support roles can and will be replaced by AI um, in uh, subsequently enhancing worker productivity. So if we think back to that previous slide where it suggested that there was going to be a change in what a worker's day looks like, where if AI is supplanting some of those tasks, what then can the worker find time for? So that's where that productivity piece gets reintroduced is that if we are eliminating worker time needed, for certain tasks, how can the worker spend that new available time to complete additional tasks and make that job easier and more efficient? So uh, looking at this next one, this is a, uh, an extension of the previous chart where we're looking at uh, the degree of automation, uh, again, focused on tasks specifically. So this is um, nearly inverse to the previous chart. So if we look at the building and grounds cleaning and maintenance on this chart, they're expecting no more than zero to 10% of those tasks are exposed to automation compared to some of the, uh, the other industries further out here, such as legal, uh, the legal industry, where AI is only expected to act as a complement. So this is a really nice chart uh, to compare against some of the industries that you all are familiar with, asking the question, how much is AI going to automate and act as a complement? And how much is it likely to be a replacement? So when we look at uh, the gray series, those that are most exposed to replacement, again, we see office and administrative support upwards of 20 to 30 percent um, of those uh, industry employment is likely to be replaced, whereas even more is likely to have an AI complement. So it's not a matter of if, but when in terms of AI deployment in pretty much any of these industries and what we should expect in terms of the next five to 10 years, how much automation uh, to what extent is going to be a replacement. And I think it's important to keep all of those things in mind uh, when we're really considering what the impact is going to be. Now, from the company level, that raises some other um, points of conflict, and that's where another point of research we found within the Goldman Sachs report really begged us to look further into uh, some DEI concerns. And so uh, I pulled two quotes in here. One of them was from Sherm just last year that uh, I'll go ahead and read aloud jobs predominantly held by women are most at risk of being replaced by AI. These positions include bill and account collectors, payroll and timekeeping clerks, executive secretaries, word processors, and typists and accounting specialists. So even SHRM is already recognizing that there's going to be a disparate impact between genders when it comes to AI implementation. Uh, we're going to look at a slide, I think it's uh, one of the next few slides here that looks at a breakdown of male versus female dominated occupations and when we compare that in retrospect to some of the other slides we just viewed we're going to see just how disproportionate the impact is going to be on men versus women so um, the second piece of research is from the Keenan Institute which found that 21 percent more women are exposed to AI automation than men even though men outnumber women in the workforce so let's take a look at some of these figures this is again from the Keenan Institute and we're seeing that same common thread from the last few slides office and administrative support positions sales and related occupations um, a, a lot of these are office intensive roles that are going to have some degree of automation uh, or replacement so because of the disproportionate uh, participation in men versus women within these occupations, uh, that's where that disproportionate outcome results from. So it's something that's going to be very important for businesses to consider in the next couple of years is 
how can we develop policies and how can we be cognizant of this disproportionate impact based on the type of business we are operating here. These graphics I pulled in from Wynn's own labor market data just to highlight that within the Wynn region, uh, just how stark the contrast can be in male versus female participation looking at different industries. So of course, um, I don't think it's any surprise to anybody that within the skilled trades, which are far less vulnerable to AI automation, we have 86.5% male versus only 13.5% female. If we compare that to healthcare, which is going to be more prone to AI uh, supplementation or automation, we see the inverse, 80.3% percent uh, female domination in healthcare compared to just under 20 percent male participation. So again, this is from Wynn's own labor market data, and I really think it highlights that within certain industries, the disproportionate impact will be felt, and it's important to start thinking about uh, creative ways to address these issues before they are um, you know, brought to the forefront by how quickly this technology is evolving. So key takeaways here, we know that AI is changing on a daily basis. Lucas alluded to this as well, that, you know, if we give this same presentation uh, even a year from now, it's going to look very different because of how rapidly things are changing. Um, However, I do think some of those slides also illustrated that AI is poised to act as a complement in many different careers. So it's important to understand within our own line of work just what the scope of change is going to be. We can anticipate some of these changes and begin building our own skill sets around these tools and learning how to leverage them to make ourselves less vulnerable as employees. Uh, jobs with predominantly female demographics going to be more exposed to AI automation um, based on some of the last few slides we saw. I think it's apparent that some organizations are going to need to be more cognizant of this change. And again, the suggestion would be to develop some DEI policies that will support the transition to an AI driven economy. I think that's going to be very important in order to minimize that occupational exposure. Um, so it's important for employees at the individual level to do their part. It's important for businesses to do their part to mitigate and address some of these changes that are, uh, you know, they're very much inevitable. Uh, it's really just a matter of when. So looking at uh, different tools and how uh, we can leverage AI to become more productive, to be part of the change and the transition to that AI economy. Uh, one of the things that's become a common theme as we have learned more about AI at Win is that domain knowledge is irreplaceable. We've seen this bear out not only in the research that we've analyzed, but also in some of the real world examples that have been shared with us by colleagues and other staff that you can use AI tools like chat GPT to create outputs for you, but you have to have at least some level of domain knowledge in order to separate the wheat from the chaff. Two examples that I provided here were some that were given to me and uh, I thought it was really fascinating. Some of these tools are capable and um, Lucas highlighted this as well. You can generate an entire website that, uh, you know, you can generate the code, have it launch, and then it's live for you. But if you have no experience with CSS or HTML or with uh, have any coding background, you don't have any means of making sure that your code is going to be bug free. I know there were a lot of examples early on where people were talking about uh, how novel it was that Chad GPT could generate code, but that it was still very much error prone. But the only people who are going to be able to identify those errors are people with domain knowledge in that area. So to many uh, uh, office workers, ourselves included. I know my my colleague Da Young, who's uh, participating today as well. We've had several talks about this and how we can be cognizant of changes and opportunities in generative AI to um, uh, jokingly prevent our own demise here at Win. But what we've found is that even with some of these tools that 
you know, as much evolution as has undergone with many of them over the last 12 months, they still are not fully capable of replacing the knowledge that we possess in order to generate the same outputs. So those are prime examples of where if staff can learn to leverage the tools, they're going to be much better suited to maintain these positions and make them more productive overall. So that domain knowledge is a huge component. Um, another funny example that was shared with us was by a law office that uh, they were starting to explore uh, uses within the generative AI landscape and found that uh, some case law citations that were provided as part of the chat GPT outlook were completely fabricated. So it, it's an imperfect tool, which is why the domain knowledge is so important as we start to learn how to use some of these. So lastly, uh, and Alicia, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I want to make sure I'm leaving uh, some opportunity for questions at the end here, but I thought it would be fun to take a quick look at how some of these tools can be used for the comms committee. So two of them we're going to take a very quick look at are ChatGPT and one that I started using just in the last couple of months called Harpa AI, which is a plugin for a browser on any Chromium based browser. So let me switch over here and we're going to take yeah, a don't look leave us at... hanging which one's fake there oh okay uh, let's take a look here so i'm going to go ahead and take a guess myself here and to be fully honest i've done this quite a bit now so i'm starting to get an eye for it i think this one is real and i'm correct oh, so it, nice. this is fun if, if anybody has a chance and wants to spend a few minutes on their lunch playing around this is kind of fun i think you will start to pick up on some of the things that uh, ai hasn't quite figured out from a visual representation standpoint but still um you know just seeing how capable the tools really are is fascinating so so for... kevin we're running out of time but i do want you to show these things we only have about three minutes so if you can gotcha. do it really fast um quick run through okay yeah. harpa ai let's say you have a video you want to summarize this is a 40 minute video anybody who was at mackinac policy conference or learned about it last year knows that mark cuban was present and he talked about the mackinac policy conference but because we only have three minutes left we're going to use harpa ai the plugin here and i'm going to ask it to simply summarize the video so because we only have three minutes and not 40 to look through the entire uh video i'm just going to use harpa ai and you can see just how quickly it's able to read through all of the transcripts preview the video and present all of these bullet points with timestamps so that i can very easily go back and revisit some of this so this is one of the tools that i highly recommend ARPA AI as a browser plugin for any Chromium based browser. And then we can do the same thing. This is the Goldman Sachs research paper. We can go to ARPA AI. Um, let's see, chat. Nope, I didn't want to chat with Paige. Let me refresh that. I'll jump over to using chat GPT for communication specifically. Uh, one of the prompts we used was uh, pretend you're a content creator who writes blog posts. Uh, give it all these different parameters. You have to produce one blog post per week, create a content calendar for the month of July, complete with publication dates, post titles that are SEO optimized and a three sentence summary. And you can see that I mean, if you're into content creation, uh, members of the committee, this is a phenomenal way to start generating ideas. And there's no rule saying that you have to use everything here, but even just coming up with ideas and using this as a sort of writing prompt, like all the journals that we used to buy back in the 90s, this is an excellent tool for generating ideas that you can then take and run with. Another example was I took one of those um, outputs and then I told it to produce a blog post. I wanted to see how good it could do at writing content and it, it really is compelling. So if you have a chance uh, to use this tool, learn about prompting and how to maximize prompt productivity. So Alicia, I'm going to um, run this and turn it over to you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you can keep sharing and, and run it if you want, just so we can see in the background. Um, thank you so much, Lucas and Kevin. We do have one question. Do you think AI will truly replace a lot of our jobs or will it change the way we are doing our jobs, if that makes sense? And, and feel free to type any other questions in the chat. Yeah, I mean, it's an impossible question to answer in 15, 20, 30 seconds. <laughs> um, I, think, I think some of the data that Kevin shared 
around, you know, over the course of the last 50, 60, 70 years, right? The jobs mm -hmm. that existed before don't exist today. And so inevitably it's going to change our jobs and over a period of time, eventually those jobs will seem unrecognizable. I think there is a question about how quickly that happens. And I think we have some control over how quickly that happens. And I wouldn't want us as a society to make mistakes we made in the past where we allowed these shifts to happen so fast without providing support to people to evolve and, and adjust to those shifts and to upskill as needed, because we've seen what the consequences of that could be. So yeah, really complicated, but that's my uh, kind of high level view. Yeah, no, I definitely fine. agree. Thank you. All right, if we don't have any other questions, it is the top of the hour. So thank you so much to our presenters. If you have any questions, you know, I put their email on the agenda. Um, feel free to reach out to them or me and we can connect you. Um, we will send the presentations out as well um, and a recording. So um, thanks so much. Have a wonderful Friday. Happy President's Day to you all. Um, and hopefully everyone can get some rest and safe travels home, Lucas. <laughs> thanks, Alicia. Thanks, Kevin. Everyone take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.